You know, it's like uh, people will say, well, well, pastor, you don't speak for God. Yes, I do. No, I absolutely do. And you believe on him through my word. Now, once you believe my word, you have your own relationship with him. And what happens is the truth of my word is verified once you believe on him. See, what makes my word true is not that I said it. What, what makes my word true is once you believed it, you know it came from him. But if you don't ever believe it, then you won't ever believe it came from him. It's, it's good stuff tonight. Now, now, why did I say that? Because when we get later down in this series, you're going to have to believe on him through my word because I'm going to teach you how to live in this world. And I'm going to give you a scriptural foundation, but I'm not going to support every statement with a scripture. There are things I know based on the scripture that are happening in these times. You're going to have to believe me. And once you believe me, you'll find out it's not me, it's him. But if you don't believe me, it'll just be me. He came unto his own, his own received him not. He came into the world, the world knew him not. But as many as believed, right? Next statement. Jesus did not send us into the world alone. That's good news. Jesus didn't send us into the world alone. I know sometimes we like to think we're going it alone. But he sent us with the Father and the Son by the Holy Spirit. And he sent us with each other. So we are not to be in the world by ourselves. Because he sent us with, his, with the Father and the Son. How did he do that? By the Holy Spirit. That's why verse, uh, chapter 16 said, I will not leave you comfortless. I'm going to send you another comforter, and you're going to know him because he's like unto me. But he not only sent us with the comforter, but he sent us with each other. Next statement. Jesus sent us into the world so that the world might know and believe who he is. Jesus sent us into the world so that the world might know and believe who he is. That's why he sent us. That's why he sent the disciples. That's what we, the last thing we wrote, so that the world might believe that thou hast sent me. And it's restated again at the end of this same prayer and this same chapter. So listen to this church, to fulfill the assignment that's been given us in Jesus' prayer, we have to know how to live in this world. Yeah. To fulfill the assignment that Jesus has given us in his prayer, we have to know how to live in this world. Now I'm using in this world on purpose. In this 2018 world, we have to know how to live in this world. Now, throughout the Bible, God has taught his people how to live in this world. Look at it. We can start all the way back in the Old Testament. We, we can start before the children of Israel were a people. We can start with Abraham. Showed him how to live in the world in which he was a part. You see it with Moses. You see it with Joshua. You see it through the prophets. God was constantly teaching the nation of Israel 
This is what's to your left. This is what's to your right. This is what's going on around you. And this is how I want you to live in this world. You see it with Solomon when he penned the Proverbs. Proverbs are basically an instruction manual that God gave to Solomon on how to live in the world. You can see it in the songs that he wrote with David. They were instruction manuals. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He's teaching him how to live in this world. And I'll make you like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. Your leaf will not wither, and whatsoever you do will prosper. But the ungodly, he's teaching them how to live. They're not so. They're like the chaff that the wind has driven, driven away. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He's teaching them how to live. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no either. Why? Because thou art with me. How is he with me? His rod and his staff, it comforts me. Well, that may not make much sense to you because you don't walk around with a rod and a staff, but to a shepherd, it meant everything. He was teaching him how to live in this world. He told Solomon, when you get to evil, avoid it. Pass not by it. Look not upon it. Turn away from it. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. He told him, beware strange women. Stay with the wife of your youth. He was teaching him how to live in a time when he could have any woman. Solomon pinned how to live, but couldn't live what he pinned. Wiped him out. Wiped him out. Look at the Gospels. Everything that Jesus taught, he was teaching us how to live in this world. Look at the Paulinian letters. Look at what Paul told the church at Philippi, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Look at what he told Timothy. Timothy, know this so that in the last days, perilous times shall come. He was taking time, he was teaching them how to live in this world. Why am I going through all of this? Because I want you to know that I have a responsibility to teach the church how to live in this world. And if I don't teach you how to live in this world, I will fail in my job. I am a shepherd under the under shepherd. And it's my job to teach you how to be protected in the times in which you live. And one of the problems in the church today is that pastors no longer want to teach people how to live in this world because we have been intimidated by the world in which we live. We're intimidated to say certain things. We're intimidated to speak certain things. We're intimidated to represent certain truths. We're intimidated to keep unrighteousness out of the church. We're intimidated that if we con don't conform, if I don't start hanging my pants and wearing T-shirts in church and speaking a certain way, if I don't let some of this stuff in, my people will flee. But one of my number one jobs is to teach you how to live in this world. Because Jesus prayed that you be in this world, but protected from the evil. And the only way to be protected is with the truth. And the only way to get the truth is from a preacher. It's my job. And, and I don't care how much you may want to mix in error with the truth. I got to protect you. And even if that means the church go down to three people, we'll be all right. We, we got to be protected. And so I, I have, uh, not church not going to go down to three people, maybe ten. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm going to get to the intent and all of that in a minute. But those in this church who have been restored now must be taught how to live in this world. 
See, th those who have been restored, I, I've put a great amount of effort in restoring people, restoring their relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Now, I can't restore you and don't protect you. Uh, otherwise, what was the purpose of the work? Th those who have been restored, they have to be protected. And, and uh, the only way you can be protected is with the truth. And, and I see, I've watched this uh, story unfold before. There, there were a lot of people when I was in my 20s and 30s in this church who were restored. There was a great move of restoration in this church about 20 years ago, give or take, a, about 25 years ago. Many people who were just post-college post and young adults and just starting out, God met us here and we, we gave our lives to the Lord and we were excited about what God was doing. And I've watched over the years as those who God brought in have dwindled away, gone by the wayside. Not everybody, but too many. And when I find them now, they're in the world. Many of them are not even in a church. Marriages dwindled away. Families dwindled away. Spiritual walk dwindled away. And I am not going to allow that to happen again. Just not going to let it happen. Now, you can, you can haul off and do whatever you want. <laughs> but I'm like, Jesus, those who have believed on him through my word, I'm praying that God protect you. And, and there, there are young adults in this church who are trusting me with their lives. They, they, they're believing on God through my word. And I have a responsibility to protect you. You, you might not like all the things I'm going to say, but they're for your protection. And, and the same pastor who worked to get you to know the Lord it's not going to do anything now that will cause you not to stay in a relationship with him. So if I say something that hits something that's close to you, just know I'm trying to protect you with the truth. So here's my intent. My intent is to protect us from the evil of this world. That's my intent. You know, that word evil has a lot of different meanings, but I just want to go through a couple of them just so you can understand what I'm saying. I want to protect you from the world damaging your character. You know, we, we live in a time now where it's very easy to have your character damaged. And, and what this, the evil of this world will do is damage your character. You know, it's, it's, uh, we're, we're living in a time now where everything you say and everything you do, the world can take it and amplify it for the destruction of your character. And I want you to be protected from that. Th that word evil means to have something hurtful happen to you. I want to protect you from being hurt. You know, let, let's clarify something. You don't have to be hurt. You don't have to be hurt. Hurt is not the way you, have, you grow up. I want to protect you from being hurt. You know, the world will hurt you. And the world will tell you that getting hurt is just, you know, that's, that's the part of life experience. You know, you just got to go through some hurts and go through some pains. And that, now the church sings that too. And all of a sudden you can't de de decipher. So all of a sudden the world is hurting you and you think it's a godly experience. Come on now. Because the gospel song mixes in sinful hurts 
as if they're godly experiences. Uh oh. And so now we start thinking that worldly hurts are godly experiences that God is using to strengthen us. That was a worldly hurt. Baby daddy not paying alimony was a worldly hurt. That wasn't a godly hurt. Running up bills that you couldn't pay, that wasn't a godly hurt. That was a worldly hurt. But when we don't know evil when we see it, evil will hurt us and we think it's God. And I don't want you to be hurt. Listen, the evil of this world is grievous to God. I don't want you to do things that make God grieve. But here's the thing, that word evil by basic definition means the malicious intent of the adversary. I want to protect you from the malicious intent of the adversary. In other words, our adversary means us no good. So what's my purpose? The purpose of this teaching is to sanctify us with truth. You know what it means to sanctify with truth? It means to separate us from evil things. To separate us from evil things. You know, some evil things, you just got to, God wants to just separate you from them. Now, don't try to go down a list of what you think I'm going to take away from you. <laughs> See, don't, don't try to go down a list. Oh, he getting ready to talk, take away this or take away that. I'm trying to, all only thing that God's going to take out of your life in this series is evil things. And you really don't want evil things in your life. <laughs> to sanctify means to purify us. You know, when you're purified, you're free from the guilt of sin. I just want us to be free from the guilt of sin. You know, I, I can remember a time in my life when it was not pure. Now, see, here's the thing. Only believers have guilt. Right. Only we have the guilt of sin. Sinners don't have the guilt of sin because they, they're sinning. Only believers have the guilt of sin. Because we have a relationship with our Heavenly Father. See, a sinner is not displeasing anybody. But as a believer, I'm displeasing God. And God dwells in me. So I know when he's not pleased. And there's nothing worse than the guilt of sin. Because, listen, because then you just feel bad all the time. You feel bad when you're sinning, because you know you are not to be sinning. You feel bad when you're in church, because you know you were sinning. <laughs> it's just bad all the time. You don't get the enjoy. Listen, the enjoyment of sin only lasts for a season. You don't even get that. Because the whole time you're sinning, you know better. The Holy Ghost saying, what? You are out of your mind. <laughs> then you come to church, you can't rejoice. Why? Because yesterday you was out sinning. So every message, pastor just, like he just, all on me. No, I'm, it just doesn't seem like nothing ever is encouraging at church. Well, no, <laughs> everybody else leaving encouraged but you. To sanctify us with the truth means to clean us on the inside. To clean us on the inside. And... You know, the definition that we use the most here in the church, it means to separate us or to set us apart for a sacred purpose. To set us apart for a sacred purpose. In other words, to have a life that's now dedicated to God. Don't you want to have a life that's dedicated to God? That's a greater purpose. Can't have it unless you're sanctified. And I've, I've watched people who I believe God wants to do great things in their life, 
struggle for year after year after year after year after year because they just won't let truth clean them up. Just pull and tug and pull and tug. And I know I ought to do better and I'm gonna get it right and I know I need to make some changes and I know I'm not doing everything. Well, let truth wash you. You know, for my young, young adults in here, don't be 50 still in the same bath water that you in in 20. You know, when I was a child, there was nothing worse than being in old bath water. And I don't know if this ever happened to anybody, but this happened to me, that you get out the tub and your parents say you weren't clean and they make you get back in the tub. It's something about getting back in that water that's just, you just, you don't want to get back in a tub after you've been out of it. You know, it's, some, it's gotten cold, you know, it's gray. <laughs> All the bubbles are gone. You know, there's no suds left anymore. You can't play in that water. I mean, it's just, you know, it's like, it's like getting in a swamp. You get back in that tub, it's like, not that tub. Listen, let, let truth clean you so you don't have to get back in that tub. Now, God may put you in another tub at another time, but at least it's a fresh cleaning. <laughs> Amen. Nice bubbly water. You, you know, you don't want to get back into that water again. Now, here, here's the goal. The goal is to actualize our vision in this world. My goal is to actualize our vision in the world in which we live. That's, I said it differently, so let me say it the right way. I told you my eye, you know. The goal is to actualize our vision in the world in which we live. The vision of this church is to be a church that what? Loves God, what? Hates sin, and what? Okay, we want to actualize that in the world in which we live. We want to actualize that individually. In other words, I want you to love God, hate sin, and love to give in this world in which you live. I want this church to be a church that loves God, hates sin, and loves to give in the world in which we live. You know, there, there are a lot of uh, churches now that don't think you can even mention sin because they haven't been sanctified with the truth. And, and the world has declassified most sins. In other words, that, oh, that's not a sin. Oh, no, no, that's not a sin. And so now the church is declassifying sins. So you, you can turn on Christian radio and hear them talk about what to do with your boyfriend that you're living with. We just declassified sin. See, the only thing you can do with your boyfriend that you're living with is move out. And stop sinning. That's all you can do. So why we're taking three and four calls? <laughs> when there's only one thing you can do, stop sinning. See, now, how, how can the church start declassifying sin because it hasn't been sanctified. Listen, we cannot actualize our vision unless we're sanctified. We can't move the church forward in the world in which we live unless we're sanctified. We're in a time of change, right? Now, you've not heard me say this the way I'm going to say it. But one of the reasons we're in a time of change is because of the world in which we live. One of the reasons why we're in a time of change is because of the world in which we live. Because the world in which we live has changed. So God has had to bring change into the church so we can remain who we are 
in the midst of a changing world. I'm going to say that again. See, the world in which we live has changed. So God has had to change the church so that we can remain who we are in the midst of change. Pastor, you're going to have to come Sunday and Tuesday for this to make sense to you. Now, most people think that when the world changes, the church has to change by becoming more worldly so it can stay relevant. What God wants to do is bring about change in the church that's going to make us more holy so that we can remain who we are as the world continues to change. See, God, God is not moving us to a time of leniency because the world is getting worse. God is moving us to a higher standard of excellence in a corrupt time. God's trying to make light clearer in darkness, not make light look like darkness. And, and what some of us who've been in church for a while are going to have to kind of wrap our minds around is that those who God has called us to restore want light, yeah. not gray. Yeah. They want light. They want it clear. If they wanted gray, they could be in the world because the, the times in which we live are perpetuating gray. But they're saying, wait a minute, something's wrong with all this gray. There has to be something that's right and something that's wrong. There, there, God has to have a will. I mean, it can't be just anything and everything goes. There has to be something that I'm supposed to do, and there has to be something that I'm not supposed to do. I can't just make up everything based on how I think. I can't make up my gender. I can't make up my age. I can't make up my identity. I can't make up my conduct. There has to be something higher than me, and I need somebody to clearly show me what is right versus what is wrong because the world has told me that everything is okay as long as it's okay with me. And I can't be the final authority of my own life. There has to be somebody higher than me that's looking down on me that has an opinion about my life. I cannot be the sole arbiter of my well-being. I can't be God. There has to be a God. I don't get to decide who gets into heaven and how I get into heaven. There has to be somebody who sits high and has some answers for me. Because all this foolishness I'm seeing, I can't weave my way through it. And God is calling us to actualize our vision in the times and in the world in which we live. Now, when we come back next week, I'll give you our six objectives, and we'll start to look at the first objective, which is very simple. What is the world? What is the world? But I can't tell you tonight because my time is up, and I thank you for yours. Amen? God is good. That's why you got to come back every week because we're going to take this little bit by little bit by little bit. Amen? If you're watching, if you're listening, we want you to know that God loves you, that he desires to do a work in your heart and in your life, but you have to be willing to invite him in. Ask him to save you. Ask him to change you. Ask him to turn your life around, and he will. God bless you, and we love you.